Welcome back to the Jen Curtis podcast, or I've renamed it recently as the Healthy Middle Ground podcast, um, where I like to talk about health and fitness topics um, and fat loss in particular, um, and try and bring in some nuance into the conversation rather than resorting to extremes like most things are on social media today. Today is episode 18. I'm getting really close to um, that like magic number of 20. I read recently that 90% of podcasts don't make it past the 20th episode. So I'm really trying to hit that. <laughs> um, hopefully then I'll continue well beyond that. Today I want to talk to you guys about Azempic. Azempic is a fat loss drug and it's kind of getting a lot of attention at the moment. I'm seeing lots and lots and lots um, of posts about it on social media and just like with everything else, um, lots and lots of extreme voices, people who say it's cheating, people who um, are really, really against it. And on the other hand, people who just, you know, rely on it and think it's a magic pill. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to bring some nuance into that conversation um, and share my experience of working with clients who have taken a Zempic um, and other fat loss drugs, um, or maybe clients that haven't and um, maybe could benefit from it, um, or just, you know, also bringing in my experience of having worked with lots and lots of clients who are overweight or obese and have been their whole lives and have struggled with weight loss their whole lives and tried every diet out there. Um, and also, um, I've worked with quite a few clients who have had bariatric surgery, and I do have some thoughts and some insights um, around this kind of like cluster of um, of topics. I will preface this by saying I am not qualified to prescribe or even recommend um, weight loss drugs or any sort of medication. Um, But this is just some of my observations from having worked with people um, who this is relevant to. And just, again, my attempt of trying to bring some balance and nuance into the conversation. So I think the first thing to say is that when it comes to fat loss, um, from having worked with hundreds of people um, at this stage in my career, um, I can tell you that we are not all coming from the same um, from the same starting point. Um, we don't all have the same ability to lose weight. Um, there are so many factors that influence our ability to lose weight. Part of those factors are genetic. Um, Like you get some people in a calorie deficit and the weight just comes off and it's just really easy for them to do. And it's just really no big stress. Um, Other people, you know, they they really have to get quite deep into quite an aggressive deficit um, to see any weight loss at all or weight loss is very, very slow. There are just genetic differences in metabolism. There are also um, people with adaptive and non-adaptive metabolism. So, you know, they their body kind of down regulates when they go into a calorie deficit. So it makes it harder for them to lose weight. And those who that doesn't happen for, so then they lose weight faster. So there are definitely genetic factors at play, but there are also massive, massive, massive environmental and lifestyle factors at play. Um, So just as an example, somebody who was brought up in a very overweight family with overweight parents, um, with certain messaging around food and diets, um, who was brought up to use food to regulate their nervous system, to comfort them, to celebrate everything, to, you know, it's some some people and some families use food and center everything around food. And something I can tell you from having spoken to lots of clients about how their parents talk around food is that some families have some really fucked up dynamics around food as well and some really fucked up ways of conceptualizing it and talking to it talking to their children about it but it also comes down to things like 
some people are real foodies and they really, really, really get a lot of enjoyment out of food. And some people just aren't that bothered. And that seems to have, you know, again, a mixture of genetic and environmental factors. It's really hard to tease out sometimes um, and social factors as well. Um, but there's definitely differences in how important a role um, food plays in people's lives. I'm somebody for whom, like little side note here, um, food used to be really, really important. And I used to just love food and love how different foods taste and different textures. And um, I used to sort of really look forward to certain treats. Um, but nowadays I don't so much. So I kind of have a bit of a perspective of both sides of the fence here. And it's definitely, definitely, definitely a lot easier to um, regulate your, um, uh, to, to, to regulate how many calories are going in um, when you care a lot less about food. And the reasons why I care a lot less about food these days, you know, part of it is due to habits that I've created and certain things that I've changed, certain things that I've actually done. But part of it is happenstance and just, you know, good luck. So um, there's kind of a mixed bag in there. But also another massive factor is people's emotional regulation and um, their ability to regulate their own emotions and how they use food to varying degrees to um, to assist in that emotional regulation and self-medicating. Now, like there's two parts of that. There's the there's the first part is um, how much emotional dysregulation you experience. And again, I have personal and professional experience and uh, of this of things like depression anxiety um just general you know worrying or ruminating thoughts um responses to stress um things like that so that's one the first part of it and then the second part is how you um regulate um those uh, varying ratios so people vary massively in how they respond to stress and how they experience stress. Um, some people experience stress so, 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 so intensely and, um, and, and very, very frequently and their whole lives are like really, really, really stressful. Um, and other people are much more chill and things don't get to them so much and they're much more optimistic. Um, and you have a huge, huge, huge advantage if you're in a second category. Um, but then there's the second part of it, of how you then regulate your emotions. Um, so there's obviously less healthy ways of regulating your emotions. And I think, and some people, you know, might use weed or some people might drink alcohol. Um, some people might smoke cigarettes. Um, and I think a lot of people use food um, to do this and that it's using food to comfort yourself and to regulate your emotions and self-medicate is a much more socially acceptable way of, um, of, of, of regulating your emotions. I think especially for mums, um, it's just so accessible. Um, it's in the house. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere. It's quite cheap um when you're stuck in the house you know it's quite easy to do um and it doesn't have you know a lot of the really negative health or obvious health um um kind of side effects like smoking or drinking um it also allows you to you're still alert unlike you know if you smoke weed or drink alcohol um you might not feel comfortable doing that when you've got small kids that you that might wake up and you need to look after them so you know eating has e eating um highly palatable comfort food really has um like doesn't have all of those you know mind altering effects that some other substances do a lot of these coping mechanisms and um overeating and um, self-medicating with food it comes from our family dynamics. It comes from, it's things that we've learned at home. It's things we've picked up along the way um, during our lives. And what I've noticed is that people kind of accumulate a lot of these habits um, that are quite mindless and they're not really very aware of them, but they accumulate them um, a lot of the time through no fault of their own throughout their life. And it kind of gets 
kind of accumulates and gets on top of them and they don't really notice it and they're not really aware of you know what their habits are and what their attitudes are around food and how food is playing a really big role in their lives and they're not really aware of just how many calories they're consuming um, through this habit of um, self-regulating with food. Other people have or have learnt um, to have some more healthy ways of regulating emotions. So uh, I can say that one of the reasons why I no longer binge eat or comfort eat, um, by no means the only reason, but one of the reasons is because I introduced exercise into my life. And when I get stressed or overwhelmed or anxious, I always, or depressed, I always turn to exercise first. Exercise and cold water are like the two things that like really snap me out of it. Um, and uh, like, if you've learned how to incorporate some of those healthier um, strategies for changing your mental state and changing your mood, you tend to rely less on food but so obviously some people um or don't have uh, or, or, or learn a lot of those self-regulating strategies from an early age um as young kids um and learn healthier strategies for emotional regulation and um, they learn how to talk and communicate better um but also some people just don't have the same degree of emotional dysregulation as others in the first place. So there's just all of that to say that there's just lots and lots and lots of factors here that means that people are coming from different starting points. Everything from the genetic to the environmental to the habits that we've accumulated over a lifetime. And um, we're not all coming from the same starting point. And some people have way more obstacles to overcome than others. So the main mechanism by which a Zempic works and helps people to lose weight is that it reduces your appetite. This obviously has huge implications for um, for fat loss, because if you're less hungry, you're going to eat less, right? And that absolutely is the case for some people. However, what I've learned from working with lots and lots of people, and not just people who've taken a Zempic, is that the people who struggle with their weight the most um, don't actually struggle with appetite. So the reasons why they struggle with um, weight loss or weight gain and excess weight is because um, they actually is for lots of other factors and normally a lot to do with the emotional side of things. So they usually experience a lot of emotional um, distress and they use food to um, self-medicate and to reduce stress and often to distract themselves from negative feelings. So this is where a lot of kind of it depends comes into it. Because if you're somebody who, um, you know, you, the reason why you struggle to lose weight is because um, because you struggle with hunger, um, then a Zempic absolutely can help. But there are people who say, you know, I've been taking a Zempic for six months and I haven't lost any weight. And usually what as far as i can tell the reason why it's not helping them lose weight is because it's not addressing the right mechanism it's reducing their appetite but their appetite isn't the reason that they eat in the first place they eat for lots of other emotional reasons and out of boredom and for distraction or for procrastination or out of pure habit and they aren't addressing any of those factors. So yes, they've got lowered appetite now, but appetite was never the reason why they were eating in the first place. So that might be one side of it, but that's probably usually some like fringe cases, right? People who are not at all affected by appetite and it's all other reasons. But for most people, there's like a combination of factors that are contributing to them uh, having excess body fat. And normally it's a combination of um, appetite and all of those other emotional slash habit slash lifestyle things. 
So what some people find is that they do lose weight taking a Zempic and um, because they um, have now lowered appetite, but then they kind of get to a certain point where they plateau and they don't lose any more weight because they haven't addressed any of those other factors. And the reason why they're still eating far too many calories a day for their actual energy expenditure needs Um but they're not addressing any of the reasons why they overeat. And the reasons why they overeat, overeat are all the things that I talked about before, emotional dysregulation, self-medicating with food. And until they address those things, they aren't going to continue losing weight. So they kind of get stuck on their journey. And then if they stop taking a Zempic, they haven't addressed any of those habit, lifestyle, emotional factors and now their appetite's back. So now they start eating more in response to an increased appetite. And then they just gain the weight back because um, everything else has stayed the same. And they haven't actually addressed. They've only temporarily addressed the appetite factor, um, but they haven't addressed any of the other factors that are keeping that have got them overweight in the first place and are keeping them overweight. Another thing about hunger is that um, being overweight, um, having excess body fat, um, and having a very, very high BMI um, does actually fuck with your appetite regulation, like your hunger and fullness hormones. A lot of people have heard of leptin and ghrelin. It absolutely does mess with this. And something that I find, even with people who don't have much weight to lose, is that um, appetites are very... Um, elastic when you eat more your appetite increases and when you eat less so when you get into a calorie deficit and um you address um uh like what you're eating and how much you're eating and food timing and all of that stuff your appetite does decrease so sometimes people struggle a little bit with hunger in the beginning but they get used to eating less food and then um, and then they actually have lowered appetites and it gets easier to stay in the calorie deficit. And colloquial, colloquially, we say, you know, your stomach expands or contracts or shrinks. Um, that's not actually what's happening. Um, it's, it's just, you, you know, your hunger and fullness um, uh, hormones um, kind of balancing out and um, responding to the amount of food that you're actually putting in your body. So anyway... The point here is that hunger is not the main reason, in my experience, why anyone struggles to lose weight. Um, yes, there are some more, like it, just to talk about something totally different for a second, um, often people who don't have that much weight to lose or who are already slim and wanna lose like the last five pounds or who want to get exceptionally lean, um, yes, hunger does become a bit of an issue. Um, and, and it is something that needs to be managed. Um, but that usually isn't the case for an overweight or obese population. Most people aren't struggling with hunger. And when you get them in a calorie deficit, they also don't struggle with hunger. Um, and the more fat that you have to lose, um, the less you struggle with hunger when you go into a calorie deficit and the, the bigger a calorie deficit you can actually physically tolerate. Psychologically, you might not be able to tolerate it, but physically you can tolerate it because you're not actually hungry. Um, the more body fat you have, the more, um, the more leptin your body um, secretes. Leptin is the fullness um, hormone that makes you feel full. Um, so you're like adipose tissue body fat actually kicks out leptin so actually the more fat that you have to lose the lower your hunger levels will be because your body doesn't need the excess fat and wants to get rid of it um, to bring you back to a place of homeostasis which is where you're healthy um, and balanced um, so you'll actually struggle with hunger less. So this is a bit of a, um, a kind of a counterintuitive thing that a lot of people don't know about um, hunger and obesity. So anyway, hunger isn't the reason why you can't lose weight when you're overweight. It's usually because of all of those other habit, lifestyle, emotional factors. But the other reason why people are overweight today and why we have an obesity 
epidemic is because we live in a very obesogenic environment. And obesogenic means that it makes you fat, right, basically. Um, and it's it, it, it comes down to two things. One, the food that we have is both abundant we have huge amounts of food way more food than we need and it's very very cheap compared to and accessible compared to every other time in history but we also have a huge abundance of highly processed highly um palatable ultra palatable um and uh, foods that are very very low in nutrition um and that's not to demonize those foods anyone who knows me knows i talk about fun foods and knows i talk about an 80 20 approach to nutrition and having some of the things that you enjoy um but that doesn't take away from the point that we still have an enormous array of foods that are engineered by you know food scientists to be a party in our mouth to have the exact right balance of savory and sweet and the right crunch factor and the right textures um and we have an enormous amount of these foods cheaply available and they're very very convenient so something i notice about very overweight people is that they will tend to skip meals and then just snack constantly throughout the day on this highly palatable stuff they get their palate gets used to having you know like taste explosions all the time and sweet and savory and like all of that going on but it's also extremely calorie dense foods so they're putting tons and tons of calories in their food without in their bodies without getting full and because they're not actually having proper meals and they're just grazing throughout the day, it's possible to get an enormous amount of calories in without ever feeling full or uncomfortable from the amount of food that's being consumed. So that's the food side of the obesogenic environment equation. And then the other side of it is that we're just extremely inactive. You know, we, just, we don't have to hunt for food. We get our food at the supermarket. We sit at computers all day. Most of us sit all day long at a desk and then we sit we get in our cars we sit again as we go home from work we don't have to walk anywhere we don't have to cycle anywhere and then we sit in front of the tv in the evening and we just don't move like a lot of people are doing less than three thousand steps a day and they're just not moving anywhere and they're not doing any exercise uh, we don't have to hunt we don't have to find shelter we don't have to we don't have these extremely labor intensive and active lifestyles that we have evolved to um to 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 you know need and depend on and that our bodies thrive on and we don't have to run away from lions and all of that stuff um so the combination of like really lowered activity levels and the accessibility of very 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 calorie dense nutrient poor foods makes us um makes it makes our environment very 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 obesogenic it makes it our environment very very fattening and it makes it very easy to consume too many calories for our very low calorie expenditure needs and this is why so many people are struggling with either being a bit overweight or being obese or morbidly obese or anything in between okay so then we've got certain individuals who for one reason or another struggle more with weight gain than others for all the reasons that i talked about before um, they start taking a Zempic. Maybe it helps them to regulate their appetite and they start losing some weight. Um, but um, the thing that I notice is that whenever you have these interventions, um, you still have to do the rest of the hard work. And fat loss is quite hard work, right? It is difficult to do. It requires a lot of mindfulness. It requires a lot of awareness around your habits. It requires a lot of tools for emotional regulation. It requires um, a lot of building good habits. And taking a Zempic doesn't address any of those other things. So while it might reduce your appetite, you still have to do all the hard work to do all of those other things, to establish good habits, to regulate your emotions, to have a good lifestyle, you know, if you have a healthy lifestyle, to sleep enough, um, to manage stress, to be physically active, you know, like we talked about not moving enough, you need to be doing 
you know, like 7k steps a day, you need to be moving around, you need to be physically active, you need to be exercising, and you need to address your food environment as well. Um, so, and all of that stuff is the really, really, really hard work. And they're the real reasons, in my experience, why people struggle to lose weight and keep it off is because of those factors and addressing those factors. So in terms of the habits, for example, let me just give you a couple of examples. So I've worked with um, some people who have either taken a Zempic or some other fat loss drug or have had bariatric surgery. And what most of them experience, and the reason why they come to me is that they had some initial fat loss results and sometimes they're really good results as well like especially with bariatric surgery like people who have lost like 30 kilos um like 60 70 pounds from or 100 pounds from bariatric surgery for example it's not usually quite so dramatic for a zempic but i've had some really good fat loss but then they've plateaued and they've just gotten stuck and then when you do like when I start with a new client and so they come to me because they're now stuck and they're not continuing to lose weight on the drug or they're starting to gain weight again and they don't understand why. And um, when I start with a new client, I do a kind of audit of their life and look at all of the things Um, that they're doing, how they're eating, things like that. And often there's some, it's not always, it's different for everyone, but there's some common themes. So most people are just grazing all day and the types of foods that they're eating are those ultra processed, highly palatable stuff. And when you actually look at what they're eating, it's adding up to thousands and thousands and thousands of calories. But to them, they don't feel particularly full um, and they feel like they're eating very small amounts. And sometimes or often they've been given the advice that they should eat little and often. So they think they're doing the right thing by sort of grazing all day. Um, But in fact, what they're doing is they're just kind of bypassing um, those mechanisms of hunger and fullness. Um, Because while a Zempic will lower your your hunger levels, you can kind of bypass it by constantly eating. So people do this with bariatric surgery as well. So um, you can only fit a very small amount of food into your stomach um, at any one time. Otherwise, you throw up. But this only works if you eat, say, four times a day. So like if you eat four times a day, then you're only eating small amounts of food, maybe even six times a day. Right. You're only eating six times, six uh, times a day, four times a day. There's only so many calories that you can consume when you're doing that. But if you just graze constant, so so it might only add up to like one thousand eight hundred calories by the end of the day. So you're going to slowly lose weight. But if you've been told eat six meals a day. Um, don't eat too much at once, like graze on little, like little and often. Um, and especially if you've had messaging like, you know, um, stoke your metabolic fire by eating lots and lots and lots of small meals or grazing, you can consume thousands of calories a day that way and you never feel full. Um, so the, the, the trick here is to getting people to eat full meals and big meals um, or bigger meals where they actually feel, you know, their stomach stretch, they actually feel that fullness and then they don't eat for like four hours, three hours, five hours, something like that. And then they get hungry and then they eat again. But people who struggle, almost everyone I know who struggles with or that I've worked with that struggles with being very overweight or obese, just grazes constantly. They don't eat actual meals. They just graze constantly. There are some people who massively under eat and then binge, but a lot of people just graze. So this bypasses that fullness um, and then uh, that, that those fullness cues, that feeling of being full and then of getting hungry again. And this is the same whether or similar, whether you've had bariatric surgery or whether you've been taking Ozempic. But again, these individuals often have um, really, really, really terrible habits, actually. Um, so grazing is one of them, not eating proper meals, um, but also using food to regulate their emotions. So when they get stressed, when they've had a hard day, when they're tired, um, they turn to food. 
and they or or if they're at work and they're bored they go and get something and they just like they like they like to have something to crunch on um they like to have either something sweet or something savory um and they like to be have their like you know mouths and hands busy with food throughout the day and these are the really this is the really really hard work right whether you take ozempic or not this is the really hard work that people have to do. And a lot of people come to me and they're like, you know, I just want a meal plan or I just want a diet or you know, they, they just kind of want a quick fix. But actually the reasons why you overeat are actually really deep and really complicated and really ingrained and changing them is really, really hard, right? So learning, like learning new habits, establishing new habits, getting somebody to stop grazing all day and eat four proper meals is really, really hard when they've just grazed their whole life. They're just constantly drawn back to constantly grazing and then they end up grazing and then they're not hungry for meals. So then they skip meals and then they end up a bit peckish. So then they continue grazing and it, it, it's kind of, it's this cycle um, that's really, really hard to get out of. Somebody who has always been a workaholic and who doesn't make time for exercise, it's really hard to get them to understand that twice a week they're going to have to do exercise. Somebody who does 3,000 steps a day, getting them to do five or 6,000 steps a day is quite a hard thing to do. And they these things have to become habits. Um, preparing nutrient dense foods, vegetables, high protein, high fiber instead of carbohydrates. These are all habits that the individual has to address and has to try to establish. And then on top of that, understanding the link between their emotional dysregulation and dis-ease and their eating habits, understanding that link and becoming more aware of it and creating, finding new ways of learning how to regulate your emotions is both difficult, it requires a lot of mindfulness, it requires a lot of attention, um, but it also requires a lot of time. It's quite a labor intensive process and it doesn't happen overnight. So it requires quite a lot of dedication to these pursuits to really get them to a point where they are very, very established. So this is my point, right? Is that Yes, like taking a Zempic can reduce your appetite, as can bariatric surgery. But that's maybe 20% of the reason why you overeat. And the other 80% of the reason is for all of those other things that you have to address and you have to do that hard work. Otherwise, one, where you won't lose very much weight on a Zempic, you'll get to a certain point and then you'll plateau. You won't lose much weight with bariatric surgery either because you'll just plateau probably still 30 kilos overweight um, uh, because all of those other things are keeping your weight elevated. Um, and two, if you stop taking a Zempic, your weight's going to go back up because the hunger that you addressed is going to come back and then you're going to just going to put the weight back on. So you have to address those other things. And that's the really, really, really hard work that people don't really want to do. Okay, so another element of this is that I like to compare this to psychiatric medication. Um, so for like, again, people struggle to varying degrees with, um, psychiatric conditions or symptoms like anxiety, um, stress, um, uh, depression, um, and some types of psychiatric medication can be really, really, really helpful for some individuals. And again, it's very similar in that we don't all have come from the same starting point. So somebody who has never struggled with depression and has a really, you know, has won the cortical lottery in terms of how, how positively and uh, they see the world and how positively they interpret events and how low they are in neuroticism. Like it's very, very hard for an individual like that to understand somebody who's struggling with chronic depression or anxiety. So it's very, it's, it's a very similar thing where if you are somebody who struggles with these mental health conditions or symptoms, sometimes medication can bring you up to a, um, 
a, a, a to, to, the, to get, give you like the same start and level the playing field for you so that you can have the same opportunities as somebody who doesn't struggle with all of those mental health um, conditions. And this could be, again, there's, there's so many comparisons to mental health because, um, you know, you could be somebody who might need it through, who might need that extra help through a certain period of your life and then you're able to come off the meds. You might be somebody who needs to take the medication for the rest of your life. Um, but it's also extremely similar to psychiatric medication in that there are lots of other factors that you also have to address. Um, so if, if you struggle with depression, anxiety, you might also have to see a psychologist. You might have to address childhood trauma. You might have to um, do some CBT and learn how to, uh, like cognitive behavioral therapy and learn how to change your thoughts and your mindset you might need to learn um ways of regulating your um emotional your 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 nervous system um through exercise or hot and cold exposure or through meditation or through breathing techniques like you if you do take medication psychiatric medication um, you still have to do all of those other things. You still have to sleep enough. You still have to regulate your circadian rhythm. You still have to exercise. You still have to eat properly. Like it's not either or. It's not like, oh, I can just take this pill and my depression's going to go away. It's like you actually have to, to address all of the reasons why you feel sh like shit and why you feel depressed and all the other, and it could be because of a, um, uh, uh, because of an imbalance in your brain and all of that stuff. But there are still other factors that are going to um, help you. And it's a case of the combination of a few different approaches is going to be much, much greater than the sum of its parts. So if you take medication and exercise and eat well and sleep properly and manage stress and do CBT, you're going to be much more successful than somebody who just takes an antidepressant. And the exact same thing is true of, um, uh, of something like a Zempic. You still have to do the hard work. It's not a magic pill. But another comparison to psychiatric medication is that it's also true that there seems to be a massive um, problem with overprescription and overdiagnosis of mental health conditions and a kind of expansion of the terms that also really dilutes things down. So two different things can be true at the same time. It can be true that some individuals really, really, really benefit from... Um, psychiatric medication. It's also true that a lot of individuals are probably taking um, psychiatric medication and don't actually need it, but they actually need to sort their lives out or have shit life syndrome or, you know, need to do other things. And that is also true of Ozempic and things, uh, other fat loss drugs. So two different things can be true at the same time. It's one of my favorite <laughs> expressions. Um, that It's not one or the other. There's no dichotomy here. I'll also go a little bit further to say that some people may need a Zempic for a period of their life. Um, some people might need it for, to take it for the rest of their lives. And some people might not need to take it at all. Exactly the same as with every other modern medication that helps level the play, playing field with certain conditions and symptoms. So again, like my personal experience of working with people who um, have taken Ozempic or had bariatric surgery is that it's been a mixed bag. Um, some people um, do like some people have like lost some weight and then they're really ready to do the work and they're really aware of the fact that the reason why they are not continuing to lose weight is um is for other factors that they haven't yet addressed and that they aren't going to continue getting the same results um by just taking the pill or 
just because by dint of having had bariatric surgery and they're really ready to do that work and address those those other factors and um, but a lot of people um really struggle to do that other work and even accept that it's something that they have to do and they kind of just rely on the bariatric surgery or the azempic and they want they 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 want to just keep doing the same thing keep the same habits keep the same um stress response and self medicating with food uh, keep the same shitty lifestyle factors and they want to somehow magically get different results and it's not going to happen um and it's a really hard pill to swallow um so it's it, it's really 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 a mixed bag and i find that these are sometimes some of the hardest people to um get change from because these habits are so ingrained and such a huge part of their identity and it's really really difficult to change and really really difficult to even stay mindful about it um and it requires a lot of work um so in conclusion i think i'm very pro um azempic and other weight loss tools bariatric surgery as well as you know things like psychiatric medications and stuff like that that i i mentioned as well i think they can be a fantastic tool for some people i think they can really level the playing field um uh having worked with so many people and being somebody who's very very interested in human psychology everyone has something everyone has like whether it's a health condition or a mental health condition or like something everyone has something that holds them back and one way that modern medicine is really really wonderful and amazing is that it has lots and lots of tools for helping those individuals if you identify the right thing that you have there's usually some kind of solution that can help you level the playing field um so i think it can be a really really helpful tool but in order to get the best results you need to do the other work and you need to do the hard work again this applies to mental health as well as to things like fat loss like you have to be willing to accept that you have a condition or a problem that maybe not everyone else has to deal with and it might not be fair and it might not be your fault but it is your responsibility and you may need to work harder than other people to get the same results um you may need to um work on this for the rest of your life um and you certainly need to use as many different tools as you possibly can to um to 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 change um the outcome and to get better results it is not a magic pill but it's not cheating either like i said it's a it's a it's a it's a great tool um it can jump start someone's journey it can uh, level the playing field um but it also comes down to a it's a very very individual thing um and it has to be prescribed or recommended on a very individual basis there are some people who will really benefit from it and it will be life changing for, for them and i've heard of people who just have like really amazing results and it all comes down to this and this has allowed them to get to improve their health and to improve their quality of life in amazing ways and then there's people who you know it's given them some results but then they don't continue to get results and then other people for whom it doesn't work for at all all of those things can be true we're all so different and um it really needs to be dished out on an individual basis i think that covers everything <laughs> um if you have any questions um if you th think i missed anything please let me know in the comments below please send me a message i'd love to hear from you i'd love to know what you thought of this episode i'd love to know your recommendations for future episodes um yeah let me know your thoughts in the comments below thanks for listening so after i recorded this podcast i realized that i did actually have one more important point to make that i completely forgot about so i'm just tacking this on to the end because i'm a really amateur podcaster and that is that 
if you are struggling with appetite and hunger and fullness, then Ozempic isn't necessarily the best way of dealing with it. Now I say that with like all of those things that I said before that I think it can be a great tool and all of that stuff. But there are usually two things that a lot of dieters, um, like two big mistakes that a lot of dieters make and a lot, like a lot of the reasons why people struggle with hunger on a diet, um, for those that do, because like I said, a lot of people don't. Um, but those that do, it's usually because of two major factors. One is simply just being in too big of a calorie deficit. So I've worked with women, for example, who their maintenance calories are like 2,200 and they're trying to diet on 1,100 calories. This is just ridiculous. It's way too big of a calorie deficit and you're going to be fucking starving on this sort of number. So the, the, the fix for that is to make sure that you are in a small calorie deficit. In order to do that, you need to figure out what your maintenance calories are. You then have to figure out a 20% deficit from there. And most people can tolerate a 20% deficit really, really well. Um, but you need to be, I, I, I have other resources on how to know how much of a deficit you need to be in. But this is, this is one major factor, like being in too big of a calorie deficit. And then that makes hunger unbearable, right? You're just starving yourself and it's never, ever, ever going to work. So that's definitely something that you need to sort out and address whether or not you take a Zempic. Because taking a Zempic and not addressing that is just like th the wrong way of doing things. Then the other thing that people don't do on a diet is they don't eat filling foods. Now, a lot of people try to curb hunger by following a lot of really, really arbitrary advice about fat loss. And the three major ones are either cutting out carbs completely or doing some kind of low carb diet like keto diets or something like that. Or they try to manage glucose spikes or they try to eat more fat in order to like slow gastric emptying or something like that. Oh, and the other major one is just trying to eat clean, just trying to eat nutritious foods. Um, so those are the sort of big ones that people try to do and think they focus on these, especially women focus on these factors. And a lot of people giving diet and weight loss advice also focus on these factors and they don't work, right? These are not the things to be focusing on. These are totally arbitrary. The thing that you actually need to focus on that most people don't focus on is getting filling foods from your diet. So focusing on how much fullness you get from certain foods. And that comes from a variety of different things. Part of it is eating, you know, actual meals. Part of it is eating um, uh, like a good macronutrient ratio, like getting plenty of protein, getting plenty of fiber. Um, but it also includes eating starchy carbs for a lot of people. Most people will be starving hungry without carbs. Um, but the major thing is focusing on fullness from foods because a lot of people will try to diet on say like you know granola for breakfast then like a sandwich with like potato chips or crisps for lunch and then afternoon snack they'll have like like dried fruit and nuts or crackers and cheese and then dinner they'll have like a creamy pasta, right? You're going to be starving hungry on these types of foods because they are very, very, very calorie dense. So per 100 calories, they don't give you much fullness. And then if you're trying to fit, you know, very calorie dense fun foods into that, like chocolate and ice cream, you are going to be starving hungry, even on maintenance calories, let alone in a calorie deficit. I do actually have a really, really, really good resource for this. So I'm going to put in the comments below or in the description below um i i have a um a, a a ebook for simple meal ideas and it comes along with two free 
ebooks, like kind of bonus ebooks. One is a filling meal ideas ebook. And then this, the third ebook is like on how to get fullness from foods, how to change your diet to get much, much, much more fullness from the foods that you're eating so that on the same number of calories, you're way more full. This is such an important thing for so many people to address. And it's one of the main things that I address with my clients and my coaching. And I would probably argue that a lot of people who are benefiting from a Zempic, they could actually get the same results from doing this and focusing on getting more filling foods in their diet and getting more fullness from the foods that they're eating. That doesn't negate any of the things that I said before. This is just like one of those other factors that you also need to address and the hard work that you need to do. You could also be using Zempic simultaneously to reduce your appetite and make all of this easier, but you absolutely, whether you take a Zempic or not, you absolutely need to address this as a factor. You can't keep eating a really, really calorie dense diet and then expecting to just take a Zimpic for a period of time and then get long lasting results. You absolutely need to address this and you can probably get very similar results from just addressing this factor. So make sure you're doing this. Um, make sure you download the ebook that I mentioned if you are struggling with hunger and satiety and fullness from foods. It will really, really help. Um, let me know what you think.